Hello, everyone. Anybody? Welcome. Anybody? Today is our final uh, spring foraging challenge lesson. And today, Sarah is coming and she's going to talk to us about edible mushrooms. And let me tell you who Sarah is. Sarah Delzel Kirkable is passionate about gardening and finding creative ways to produce food in small spaces. She enjoys empowering others to grow and cook their own food, skills that she believes build confidence. Sarah is the founder of wearingwo.com, ninjagardening.com, and also a writer with Joy Belief Farm. And Sarah is my daughter. And you have met her before because she also helps in this group. Um, and Sarah has a new book out called Growing Mushrooms for Beginners, a simple guide to cultivating mushrooms at home. So she is an expert on mushrooms. She actually knows more about mushrooms than I do probably. And uh, this is her book. And uh, Sarah's gonna share with us today some easy to identify mushrooms so that if you're brand new to mushrooms and you're a little bit nervous about getting the wrong one, there are a few mushrooms out there that don't have any poisonous lookalikes. And Sarah's gonna share those with us today, uh, both for food and for medicine. And uh, I'm gonna let you share your screen, Sarah. Let me see, there we go. I think that works. And uh, you can let us know. Okay, does that look like it's up? Yep, I'm seeing it fine. Okay, so a lot of focus when you're researching into foraging for wild mushrooms is on staying safe. There are, unfortunately, a lot of mushrooms that, while they may not be deadly poisonous, can cause gastrointestinal upset and other unpleasant effects. There are unfortunately hallucinogenic mushrooms, and there are unfortunately highly deadly mushrooms. So I've selected some of the easiest to identify mushrooms with the fewest lookalikes that are harmful, and that should be growing in most regions of North America. So let's get started. First, let's focus on staying safe. For mushrooms, and for plants or mushrooms actually, you want to have a positive ID from at least three sources. That can be three different guidebooks, that can be a guidebook, a website, and an expert mycologist or expert mushroom forager in your area. But make sure when you're first learning to ID a mushroom that you learn from at least three sources. You wanna be 100% positive that your identification of a mushroom is correct. Because if you're gonna put it in your mouth, you don't wanna have any chance of it being the wrong type of mushroom. Following that, never eat a mushroom you're unsure of. If you decide to grow mushrooms in your garden, as we've talked about before, if you can't recognize it as the type of mushroom you planted, don't eat it. If you can't positively ID a mushroom in the forest, don't try to eat it. Also, never eat a raw mushroom. The reason I say to avoid gilled meadow mushrooms is because the poisonous Amita variety grows singly and resembles white button mushrooms, white meadow mushrooms. So it's really important that if you have not planted button mushrooms, you don't eat a mushroom that looks like a button mushroom, AKA a gilled meadow mushroom. Avoiding bright colored orange or red mushrooms, usually bright colors indicate toxicity. So most poisonous mushrooms are bright colored. An example of that is um, fly agaricus, which has a bright red cap with white spots. It's the most common toadstool illustration mushroom. Avoid any mushroom growing on its own. Most poisonous mushrooms grow as singles. So the first family of mostly edible mushrooms is the bolet family. They are one of the gillless mushrooms. They do not have gills. So that is a help when you're trying to identify them. And the spores are released from a spongy layer instead of from a gill layer. Like most mushrooms you're familiar with from the store will always have gills. Bullets have a sponge layer. With bullets, the stalk is always wider at the base than at the cap attachment. Some varieties of bullets will have a slimy cap, particularly if it's recently been damp. Others will be dry. It depends on the specific type. 
They're very attractive to worms and mushroom flies. They're also attractive to squirrels. One of the jokes for mushroom foraging is that if you are looking for mushrooms and unsure, eat the mushroom that the squirrels eat. So the squirrels know, and if you see the squirrels going after a bullet species, you can be fairly sure that it is an edible one since there's actually only one poisonous bullet. Many of the bullet species bruise blue, including the poisonous one, but that is another good identifier for the bullet family. Edible bullets usually grow under conifers with some poplar species. This is another example of an edible bullet. You might notice that the sponge gill area is yellow on this particular variety. The one dangerous one's Latin name is Bulletus ruboflamius. <laughs> and it is the only poisonous member in the bullet family. It has a deep red to purplish cap, dark red pores instead of being light yellow. The stem has raised red areas and the stem goes from dark at the base and lightens to yellow close to the cap. All parts of this mushroom rapidly turn blue when damaged. Most of the edible bullet species family have white or cream tone stems, not the variegated colored stem. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Probably the most widely foraged of the wild mushrooms, the morel is a very fascinating mushroom and one that can be very difficult to find, mostly because it blends in with the leaves. Morels love aspen, birch, poplar, and can sometimes be found in abandoned orchards or on abandoned farms. All edible morals share the honeycomb look, as you saw in the previous slide. It's sort of wavy lines, it seem mostly fairly equal, and usually many of the species also have um, the same shape. All edible morals have the conical, or as I put there, gnome hat shape even the smallest ones. Morals do not have gills. So if you cut open a moral mushroom, the stem and the cap will be hollow. Most species of edible moral emerge in the spring. There are a handful of species depending on your continent that may emerge in fall or winter. Once you find a moral mushroom, you will notice that there are a lot more. Many morals have the um, raised area of the cap, a darker color than the base area. So that can make them harder to spot or easier to spot. The yellow aspen moral is one of the few edible morals that has solidly yellow. Most of the other varieties will have variegation on the cap with two colors. There are three lookalikes for the moral. First, false moral is completely dark brown with a larger distorted shape and a brain-like pattern. It doesn't follow the nice, friendly um, gnome hat shape, and it doesn't have any variegation. It's solid dark brown. Dog moral is similar to false moral, but is found under, I believe it was specifically spruce and cedar versus um, fir and pine for the edible morals, and is usually never found under deciduous trees. Elf and saddle mushrooms are not a moral, and they have two peaks with a scoop in between to look like a saddle. They also are dark, even brown tones, similar to the false moral. This is an example of one of the moral lookalikes. I believe this one is specifically the dog moral. And as you can see, compared to the moral, it doesn't have variegation. The pattern is more brain-like versus honeycomb, and it's not a friendly little cap. You are probably very familiar with seeing puffball mushrooms. All species of puffball mushroom are edible. There are multiple varieties. Some are brown, some are white, some are tiny, some are huge, but they all share the characteristic of being perfectly round and sealed. They have no gills, and when you cut into them when young, they're solid mushroom flesh. Puffballs I've most commonly found in open pasture land where animals have been. They 
don't seem to like heavy grass. They seem to like lighter grass and usually with animals. The inner flesh of a puffball as it ages gradually turns into spores. So you wanna catch them when they're young or have just recently emerged. Puffballs almost always grow in groups, but the giant puffball may only have two or three in the area. So remember to keep your eyes out. There is a lookalike, unfortunately. They, there are no lookalikes that remain perfectly sp spherical and continue to have an absence of gills. The closest lookalike is the Amanita, which when in button form can resemble a puffball mushroom. But if you knock it over and look at it, you'll notice it has the um, veil between the stem and the gills and has pink gills. It also smells like cyanide. Or as some people put it, it smells like bitter almonds or apricot pits or cherry pits. It has that um, bitter almond cyanide smell. Amanita usually grow signally at most two together. Puffballs will always grow in larger groups. Our next fun mushroom is the oyster mushroom that loves growing in trees, forests, usually with deciduous trees. There is one type of oyster mushroom, it's not a true oyster mushroom, um, that grows on elm. It's called the elm oyster. But oyster mushrooms will always grow out of logs or stumps in overlapping hands. Usually deciduous, there may be species that are not on deciduous trees. Gills go from the edge of the cap all the way down the stem. They don't stop at the base of the stem like one of their lookalikes. Oyster mushrooms, depending on your region, can be um, slightly off-white, blue, gray, bright pink, or yellow. As the exam first example I had was the pink oyster mushroom, which I think looks gorgeous. With oyster species, the stems are usually offset from the cap because it looks sort of more like a trumpet shape with it flowing together versus cap stem with a clear join. Stem and cap appear to run together. Here's an example of oyster mushrooms growing out of a log. So you get the idea that it can also resemble a shelf fungi. But if you actually look closely right here, there you can see where the stem is coming down with the gills on it. I'm covering habitat here. Different colors of oyster mushroom will fruit in different temperatures. If you know what's local to your region, you can have a fairly good idea of the right temperature to find for the new fruiting bodies coming out. The white, blue, and gray species on average like cooler temperatures, so they'll be more in northern U.S., southern Canada, um, Vancouver Island region, you're more likely to find white, blue, or gray. Yellow seems to like medium temperatures, so you're more likely to find it central U.S. And pink is tropical, and according to my husband, grows like crazy on Florida water oaks. The best resource I can suggest is either checking with a local mushroom hunter or looking for a mushroom specific field guide for your region to figure out exactly which type of oyster mushroom you should be looking for. There are a couple of poisonous lookalikes. The jack-o'-lantern is a bright orange mushroom with similar growing characteristics and similar gill structure to oyster mushroom. However, it's bright orange. Oyster mushrooms that are edible are not bright orange. The ivory funnel mushroom has the gills stop at the stem. Stem is centered and it has a defined stem and it has a ground growth habit. It's not usually found growing up trees. The last one, ghost fungus, mostly grows in India, Japan, and Australia. And while it looks similar to an oyster mushroom, it glows in the dark. I thought that was really cool. The turkey tail looks very similar to reishi mushroom, I noticed when I was studying it, except it's a lot thinner. And it's one of our most common North American wild mushrooms. One of the easiest to identify, even its lookalikes are not actually uh, harmful. They're not studied for medicinal benefit, but the turkey tail is studied for medicinal benefit. So I just wanna highlight a few things while we're looking at the picture here. 
It has a white growth ring on the outside, similar to reishi, as long as it's actively growing, which it will do for eight months, it will have that active white, whitish growth ring. So you know it's a young mushroom. Over here on this side of the image, you have older mushrooms that the color is faded on because they're from a previous year. On the underside of the turkey tail, the mushroom has pores. Again, no gills. And the pores are super fine. If you had the tip of a ballpoint pen, you would have approximately three pore points at the very tip of that pen if you poked it at the underside of this mushroom. The underside of the fruiting body for turkey tail is white or white-ish. And it has a velvety feel on the top of the mushrooms. Very fine velvet feel, probably close to what you'd get if you were, I don't know, petting a deer's antlers when they're still covered in velvet. It has strong color zones that are not related to texture and a white growing edge. Even when dry, the turkey tail is a very thin and flexible mushroom. Thicker versions or thicker, harder, non-flexible mushroom is one of the characteristics of one of its lookalikes. And turkey tail season can last up to eight months, so basically the entire summer. And it can be on hard hardwood or conifer trees. It seems to like growing on everything. False turkey tail looks almost identical, except its color, color regions are based on texturization. It has no pores on the underside and its underside is brown. False turkey tail has not been studied for medicinal benefits, but it also is not recorded as causing harm. So while it is a lookalike, it isn't as dangerous as some of the other lookalikes. Violet tooth polypore is similar to turkey tail. They're both polypores. It has similar color colorations, but the underside has a very coarse toothed characteristic to it, and it has a violet tone on the underside. Obviously, those are highlighted in its name as well. One of the interesting things about turkey tail as a medicinal mushroom is that you can literally find it anywhere in North America. It's not exclusive to any one region. It's not exclusive to any one temperature. So no matter where you are, this is a mushroom that you can look for, forage for, and harvest. Just make sure you take a knife with you. Lion's mane, this particular image is from a grow bag, but lion's mane is another wild edible mushroom that is both medicinal and culinary. And it's another awesome mushroom that it has no lookalikes. So this is a tooth fungus that grows on hardwood trees, including maple, oak, birch, and even black walnut. It's actually the only mushroom that likes growing on a black walnut. And as you might've noticed from the picture, the growing characteristic of the mushroom gives it that toothed appearance. When it's young, the teeth are finer, and as it grows old, the teeth get longer and more like icicles. It forms very large fruiting bodies, usually round, and it has the distinct toothed appearance, sometimes described as icicles or a lion's mane. I found when I grew it in from my um, grow kit that it has a strong mushroom scent with a slightly seafood-like tonality to it. One report I read found the mushroom inside a hollow tree. And of course it can be found growing on the outside of trees. Another unique characteristic about lion's mane is when you harvest a lion's mane mushroom, cut it off a little bit away from the tree trunk, leaving some of the flesh. And then if you come back in a week or two, you'll find another lion's mane mushroom has formed in that exact spot because it does regrow the fruiting body if the fruiting body is cut, as long as a little bit of the mushroom is left to regrow. This is an image of lion's mane that was actually in um, the Netherlands, but lion's mane is equally common in North America. And as you can tell from the image, the mature lion's mane has very long icicles. I also had the fun 
of both cooking with and dehydrating lion's mane. And I found that lion's mane actually dehydrated very quickly in less than three hours. And since it can be used medicinally, you can also use the dry, dried lion's mane in the same way as you would use reishi or turkey tail. Are there any questions? Or Chris, do you have anything that I missed that you would like me to cover? Um, you mentioned something about at the beginning, Sarah, of your talk about not eating mushrooms raw. Is there any other rules about eating mushrooms? Like, should should you um, avoid eating them every day? Or is it, a, is it safe to use medicinal mushrooms every day? What did you find in your research? Most mushrooms are safe to consume every day. I found... The King Stratoferia or wine cap mushroom is recommended not to eat it, consume it more than three days in a row because it can cause gastrointestinal upset. Um, from what I could tell with reishi, turkey tail, um, and medicinal mushrooms, usually they do not have any cautions about not consuming them multiple days in a row. They are advocating them as a health supplement to take daily. Was there any any dangerous lookalikes with lion's mane or is lion's mane a unique all by itself mushroom? Lion's mane is a unique mushroom. There is one other mushroom that has a slightly similar appearance, but it's a ground growing mushroom that grows in um, like fingers like coral and it's actually also edible. So there are no tree growing lookalikes for lion's mane. And the closest look like I could find was a ground growing one that was also edible. So. My other question had to do with the turkey tail. Is turkey tail an annual mushroom then? Does it grow every year or is it a perennial? Um, all mushrooms are technically perennials. They may not fruit in the exact same spot every year, but the mycelium is always in the area. From what I could tell from images with the turkey tail, it does look like it will fruit out of the same spot every season. I was also reading that it's one of the most wild harvested mushrooms in North America. So does that mean that it's endangered or is there an ample supply? It's also one of the most common wild mushrooms in North America. So there is an ample supply. And also, even if you harvest the fruiting body, you're not harming the mycelium. So the roots are always okay. there, no matter how much you harvest a mushroom. Cool. If you're concerned about mushrooms staying in the area, harvest using a net bag, like one of those um, old grocery store net bags kind of thing. And when you're walking back to your vehicle or whatever, the mushrooms will release spore into the area and you're, you will technically be reseeding mushrooms as you return to your vehicle. So is now a good time for people to go out and, and look for mushrooms or is it good right after a rain or when's the best time to go looking for mushrooms? Uh, it depends on variety. Turkey tail you can look for at any time. In the growing season, they are a very slow growing mushroom, which is why their season is the full eight months of temperate weather. Uh, we actually just had a rainfall here, so I would suggest going out either today or tomorrow in our area to look for uh, spring mushrooms, morels, and bullets. Awesome. It doesn't look like there's any other questions. I guess I'm the only curious person about mushrooms today. Thanks for for uh, joining us, Sarah, and giving us a taste of your expertise. Let me see. Do you want to tell us about your book? Well, if you're nervous about foraging for wild mushrooms, you can always purchase um, spawn or spore syringes from a reputable supplier and grow your own. And that's what my new book, Growing Mushrooms for Beginners, covers. And specifically, I focus on growing mushrooms if you don't have a lot of space, like you live in a rented home or an apartment or anywhere you'd have limited space. I focus on growing mushrooms in small quantities so you can have your own food. And you have, you have recipes you also in there too, don't you? Recipes. Aha. Yep. There's um, 30 different recipes, both medicinal and culinary. I cover a couple other varieties of mushrooms in the book. I cover a medicinal mushroom called cordyceps. Cordyceps as a species are very interesting. And I also cover wine cap mushrooms, the King Stratoferia, and agaricus species mushrooms, which are portobello and your standard white button mushroom. And I also cover shiitake, 
reishi, oyster, lion's mane, and lion's mane in the book on how to grow them at home yourself. And I'm just going to check the chat. So I'm going to have to stop share to be able to view the chat. Okay, there were no questions. So Chris, did you have anything else? There we go. Thank you for joining us today, Sarah. So thanks for joining us and have a good weekend. Bye-bye.